Good one. And then the next one isn't until the end of February. So enjoy tonight while you can. So first of all, I'd like to acknowledge and pay respects to the ancestors and descendants and elders, past, present, and emerging of the people of the Banjalang Nation upon whose land we are holding this event. I also acknowledge the ongoing, unceded sovereignty of this land, which always will be the traditional owner's land. And tonight we're live streaming, so it means that people who couldn't actually get here tonight can see it. You just have to have a Facebook account, and then you go to facebook.com, Nagara Institute Australia, and you will find the live streaming in case you want to quickly SMS your friends. To start the evening, I'd like to share an abbreviated version of the letter our convener, Dr. Richard Hill, wrote to introduce our topic tonight, which is, and now for something completely different <laughs> and special, a few of our local heroes. It's a bit trite to say that we're facing a crisis. The truth is we're facing multiple intersecting challenges and crises, such as economic, social, ecological, climatic and nuclear. At least two of these, climatic and nuclear, pose a direct existential threat to the planet and everything on it. The others mean more discord, instability, and greater challenges for all of us. While not every crisis can be attributed to neoliberalism, some can. And it holds the view that we are competitors rather than social beings bound together in complex interdependent relationships. Margaret Thatcher once thunders, thunderously roared, there's no such thing as society. But I believe here in Mullumbimby we know there is. According to the architects of neoliberalism, we should privatize everything get rid of government regulations, and make the poor and marginalized fend for themselves. If the market is left to its own devices, which it never is, then they believe a new spontaneous order will arise that rewards the entrepreneurs and go-getters and becomes hugely beneficial for the world's rich and powerful. Given this scenario, is it any wonder that we're witnessing a loss of trust in demo democratic institutions in, and in democracy itself? The recent midterm elections in the US show the extent of the polarization of civil society today. We're seeing the same phenomena occur in many other parts of the world, including Australia with a former Liberal Party leader warning of the Trumpification of Australia. Trump, of course, as Noam Chomsky has observed, is a distraction, while the really important strings are being pulled by the likes of the Koch brothers, who have helped fund the corporate takeover. Tens of millions of dollars have flowed into sympathetic universities, they have to be sympathetic, political campaigns and lobbyists. As Jane Mayer notes in Dark Money, the corporate takeover has been in the planning for a long time, orchestrated and imposed on US and other Western nations. There is nothing accidental about it. But there's another more positive side to this story of corporate avarice. While the billionaire class has been busy enriching itself, tens of millions of people across the world have been actively participating in the environmental justice movement. It's a manifestation of what Paul Hawken refers to as the blessed unrest, and Joanna Mercy, Macy as the great turning, a profound and lasting change of consciousness that will usher in a new epoch of regenerative existence. Those involved in this movement are seeking fundamental change, a change towards a better, more joyous and livable world. 
To achieve this change, says English journalist George Monbiot, we need a new politics of belonging. We need an inspiring and informed story about us, about what it means to be human in a complex, interconnected world. It's a story that elevates the idea of community rather than economy, and which puts caring, sharing, kindness, compassion, and cooperation at the center of everything we think and do. We don't need to look very far to see the positive effects of such values being played out. The Byron Shire and its surrounds are blessed with a vibrant activist energy that has generated many alternative practices and ways of being. These are glimpses of a different future. Things are shifting, as you can see in any copy of Byron Shire's or Nimbin's local independent papers. Social and political activists have played a key role, both in creating alternative cultures, as well as resisting destructive industrial and corporate practices. So, tonight, being the last one of the year, we feature a range of our local activists reflecting on their work on this kind of topic. And they will speak in the following order. So those of you who are speaking, listen for a moment. First of all, we'll have our wonderful Annie Kia. And after that, we have our one and only Hans Lovejoy. Then we have Mullum Sasha Mainsbridge, followed by our Nagara member, Liz Elliott, Dr. Liz Elliott. And then the very well-known Jenny Cargill-Strong, and followed by our very accomplished movie and video maker Michael Bolson. And finally, last and certainly not least, one of perhaps my favorite activist of the whole two years of politics in the pub, Aidan Ricketts. <laughs> These are all people who've helped to make the world, and particularly our area of Byronshire, a very much better place. And they'll share with us tonight, perhaps, why they got involved, what worked in terms of their sphere of influence, and what they see as the next steps. That's just guidelines. They may say something totally different. We'll leave it to them. There are important lessons to be learned from their stories. So let's give a very warm Mullumbilby welcome to our first speaker, Annie Kia tonight. And I'll just uh, introduce you. I'll just say that Annie won the activists, our very own Nagara Institute Activists Award of the Year for her work with coal seam gas and with actually stopping us having fracking in this area of the country. And so she's very famous for her environment community. It's wonderful, thank you, thank you. It's really good to be here with all you good people. I, oh, it's a bit high, isn't it? Yeah. I think we'll get it a bit lower. Yeah. That's better. I live on Widgeable Wyable country at the Channon, and I pay my respects to elders past and present here on this country of the Bundjalung Nation. I have an, can everyone hear me? Yeah? Okay. I, I have an activist history, but I'd have to say I've learnt more during these last seven years in the Lock the Gate movement than all the years before. First, the scaling up of mass movement dynamics in this region. And then, since 2013, working with communities around the country to resist coal mines and gas fields. These years have been rich in people, in camaraderie and friendship and stress, <laughs> I'd have to say. <laughs> there have been losses along the way, but also astounding wins of organised people against corporations and governments. I'm about to share some learnings from all this, but first I have to give a bit of context. Lock the Gate attempts something that no other environmental organisation has done, taking on coal and gas projects across the entire country. This calls for a way of working 
That's very 21st century, a network of networks, a system of distributed leadership. And to do this, we use two different kinds of network structures. And this is very relevant to this topic of activism this evening. On the one hand, we encourage decentralised networks of autonomous groups. Where these groups self-organise, they have agency and creative problem solving. We encourage collaboration in regional alliances of all these different groups. And these decentralised networks generate a turbulent and dynamic movement. But to win, we need a dynamic movement plus a tight and focused campaign. This, the campaign is where we focus all that community power on decision makers with laser-like intensity. And for this, we need a centralised network. For example, we ask supporters to email or phone a minister all on one day. On one occasion in New South Wales, our, our national, we did this, and our national coordinator got a call after a few hours from the minister's office saying, can you guys call it off, like we can't cope, and when would you like to meet? So that's an example of converting community power to political power. So there's a continuum of engagement in decentralised networks, activists have high agency and they meet for purposeful collective action. And at the other end of the continuum, people engage in a campaign as a supporter and connect with the campaign by being willing to enter our database and to take occasional action when we need to ramp up pressure on power holders. And sometimes supporters might move up the continuum into an activist role by saying, OK, for the next three months I'm going to do a weekly stall for the Time to Choose campaign. And then they might move back again. The point is, we need everyone. Everyone adds value. And let me give an example. The coming New South Wales election is our chance to push all political parties on coal and gas policy. Newcastle is the world's biggest coal port and, taken together, 11 of the new coal expansions are bigger than Adani in emissions and impacts on land and water. This is a disaster. Time to Choose is our campaign to push all parties to adopt 12 commitments on coal and gas. The cornerstone tactic is the ballot in the people's referendum on coal and gas. I'm going to pause and ask you all a question. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if you say yes to this. Do you support a new approach in New South Wales for clean energy and for protecting farmland and water from coal and gas field development? Yay! Yay. Great. Please, before you go, tick. I support on this people's referendum, if you haven't done it already, and write your details. And Maddie and Tom are standing up and are going to help us collect these at the end of the evening. But I'm actually using this to demonstrate what I'm talking about with the different roles that people have. This method, this ballot, creates a doorway for you to enter the supporter role. But it also creates a doorway for the activist role, organising to run stalls to get the public voting, and it helps us show the parties we have grassroots power in marginal electorates. To me, activism is purposeful political action of citizens who learn together how to exercise collective power. Here are three important things I've learned. First, collective intelligence is only liberated in face-to-face -face groups. It's a potent thing when people group up for purposeful collective action. Secondly, to win, we need to connect up. Please say yes to getting emails from us. Sometimes frontline activists are distrustful of this aspect of campaigns. But the database is good. It empowers citizens to enter a supporter role. It helps us focus that power when we need to. Thirdly, be kind to each other. We need everyone. The last thing on my brief was to reflect on a challenge and recommend an action.
There is an unbearable sorrow in witnessing the loss of nature. Tayyad Chardin said, in humans, evolution becomes conscious of itself. How painful that connection has become. We will have some great wins together, but losses are coming, and grief. There is another way of thinking about an action group as practice, like meditation, or going to a choir, or yoga. A weekly practice of collective action, whatever it is, a plastics campaign group, a commit or a commitment for the next four months to spend four hours a week collecting ballots and talking to people about time to choose. A weekly practice of collective action. There's something protective from the network we weave when doing this. Protective for our own well-being and protective for community. To live in these times more than ever, we need the holding network of community and the resilience that comes from it. A weekly practice of collective action. If this appeals to you, please write that on your ballot paper. When you tick support and share your details, we would love to act collectively with you. So now I'd like to bring and welcome to the stage Hans Lovejoy. We all know him as an extreme and are extremely grateful to him um, as his role of the editor of the Byron Shire Echo for the last eight years providing our community with a powerful voice for change. But not everyone knows that he's also a graduate of the Canberra School of Music and a very accomplished musician, playing both double bass and electric bass for more than 20 years. Let's have a warm Mullumbimby welcome for Hans Lovejoy. Hello. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thanks very much for having me. Um, I'll just start by saying that I'm... Let's take it out there. Yep. No, no, that's... Yeah. Trust me. Yeah. Trust me, I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, thanks for having me. I'll, uh, I'd just like to start by saying that I'm not much of a public speaker, so forgive me if I mumble and look at my cues a little bit too much. Uh, clearly, my activism is uh, mostly keyboard warrior. So, activism to me is simply reflected in the Echo's motto, as penned by Finley Peter Dunn, comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> so yet yeah, activism, as the word suggests, is just about being active in furthering a political cause, no matter what ideology it is. So I'd like to talk about activism media or journalists who use activism as part of their writing style. Because there's really only two types of journalists, or three if you count lazy journalists. There are those who are embedded in the system, and those, like me, who are not. <coughs> if you are embedded, that means that you are aligned with those who could be described as being inside the tent. It's a political expression whereby those who wield power do not discuss to the outside what really goes on inside. It's sort of like Fight Club. So anyway, the tent club protect themselves from political scrutiny and accountability by surrounding themselves with similar actors. Sometimes it works and other times it doesn't. They could be described as aspirational, sycophantic types and are made up of business interests, politicians, bureaucrats and journalists. They hang around the tent entrance hoping to get invited in further. And some do and some don't. Well, most don't really. Journalists well outside the tent have to work really hard, of course, because news of the tent rarely lands on their lap. Non-embedded journalists also live a life with far more conflict with, than those that they report on because asking tough questions doesn't get you a lot of Christmas cards. <laughs> and I know that from experience. Good journalism is similar to law uh, and that is it's adversarial in nature and it requires you to think like a lawyer. The key is not to act like one. So good journalism for me is openly political in that it challenges the conventional narrative. There is an inherent bias with everyone, despite demands that journalists should report without one. And to paraphrase Jiddu Krishnamurti, 
Functioning well in a profoundly sick society takes consistent effort. <laughs> it might be apparent to everyone in this room, but the world is clearly run by insane people for insane purposes, as John Lennon said. For long-term survival and prosperity outside the tent, there's a few key things that I have learned to uh, help maintain the rage and the equilibrium. So as cheesy as it sounds, I've actually adopted, perhaps unconsciously, Carlos Castaneda's Four Enemies of the Man of Knowledge from his 1968 book, The Teachings of Don Juan. Has anyone heard of this book? Yeah. Yeah. All right, we're among friends here, all right. Okay, to become a person of knowledge, he wrote, one must challenge and defeat their four natural enemies. So number one is fear, right. So overcoming fear, I can't admit to being completely without fear, and those who do are probably lying or sociopathic. And fear is a natural response to real learning, as Castaneda wrote. I've been yelled at and abused by developers, given the cold shoulder and ignored by politicians and bureaucrats, and faced press council complaints on numerous occasions, and all were acquitted. I've lost count of the amount of times someone has threatened to sue me over what I've written, and touch wood, nothing has stuck yet. As long as there's been enough reflection onto, uh, on the, onto what you've written and uh, the approach of which you've taken, uh, and you've asked, for, uh, you've asked for comment of all concern, doubt or fear probably won't be the problem. The best way of overcoming fear is simply informing yourself before you engage. Those who have, I've reported on in the past have sought to dismiss me or my questions, which is a great technique for undermining confidence. By learning the language and the system, those inside the tent can be challenged. And basic psychology is almost a template driven in that you can predict great behavioural patterns when uh, pursuing those when, that you write about. So number two is clarity. And clarity in communication and the way a question is phrased is key as it is, as is being uh, unemotional and, sometimes, and somewhat de detached. That doesn't mean to be cold or nasty, but generally good journalism doesn't equate to uh, warm and fuzzy puff pieces. With clarity comes measure and patience, and the understanding that like everything, clarity is an illusion. It also is a tool that can be easily made blunt and can cut you if you are careless and not focused. Number three is power. Understanding power and its meanings and impacts is vital to being an effective activist. Power structures include the church, the government, the media, the courts, and of course big business. And it's good to have explore your own relationship with power. I'm aware that a point of difference between myself and those that I report on is that I'm not particularly ambitious or charming, and I believe that that to be a, a real strength for activist reporting. Uh, late comedian George Carlin said, the decay and disintegration of this culture is astonishingly, astonishingly amusing if you are emotionally detached from it. <laughs> Number four is old age, Castaneda wrote, which is the fourth enemy to the man of knowledge, blah, blah, blah. But instead, I'll make it purge the ego as much as possible. Self-critique often and rinse and repeat. Psychedelic drugs have helped me, personally, to realise the, that this is all an illusion and, uh, and not to take it too seriously. Be suspicious of charmers. This is important. Be suspicious of charmers and those who are obviously convinced by their own charm. This is particularly relevant to this area because there are so many here who use words, use words like environmental sustainability too freely and it's all very suspicious. So as for other key messages, I'll probably wrap this up. As a journalist, having an arm's length relationship with almost everyone in the community helps. It's, clear, it's, a, clear, it's a clear way to engender trust and that is needed for society to function, I think. For any civilised culture, trust is a cornerstone. Trust in business, politics and media is diminishing. So maintaining and developing what trust is left is really vital. And I believe that hyper-local media, such as community newspapers and radio, offer that. Thank you very much. We have our very own Mullumbimby, Sasha Mainsbridge, and she created Mullum Care, and probably, I don't know, single-handedly, but 
certainly was the first initiator to stop IGA having any plastic bags, which has now percolated through the whole of Byronshire so that we don't have any plastic bags anymore. That's single. That's an amazing achievement. Thank you. And also, yes. And also, so that we don't have so many bottled uh, water, plastic bottles hanging around, she got that wonderful fountain put outside of Santos. I think you community All by myself. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you, Sasha. <laughs> Thanks for having me. I feel very humbled to be here amongst some amazing local activists. I, um, I have to tell you straight off the bat that I did write a speech that I could have had here and I could have read it out, but then my dear friend Diane Hart rang me at lunchtime. She knew I was quite nervous about tonight, and when I told her what I was going to say, she's like, oh, rubbish. <laughs> Stop it. You're preaching to the converter. Just tell them about yourself and make a joke. But <laughs> to be honest, I do find it hard to joke about being an activist because I do feel it's very serious, the work that we're doing. Um, so I'm going to wing it, basically, and, and try and tell you some of the stories, some of the experiences that have brought me here today. Um, so I moved here four years ago from Victoria, and I moved here because there really was evidence that more people here actually give a shit about their impact on the current reality, but also on the future. And I, I seem to have been born giving a shit. So even um, I have this strange, strange... Uh, Feeling. I, was, I, I was once a, a very big Bombers fan in Victoria, but if they were flogging another team, it made me really uncomfortable and I kind of wanted the other team to pick up their game because it made me uncomfortable to see people being mean to or, or, or not, not um, having a good time. And as I got older, that feeling turned into sort of a social justice um, passion. So I was going to refugee rallies and I saw Tim Costello speak from Save the Children and he said to the audience, he said, if you care about the plight of refugees, you really need to start doing something about climate change because when Bangladesh goes under, it's going to be nothing like what we're dealing with now. So that really steered me away from social justice issues towards the environment. Then I saw the story of Stuff movie. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen this. It's a 20 minute video. Uh, by Annie Leonard, who's now the CEO of Greenpeace International. And it's an amazing 20 minutes. If you can watch it, it really will probably change your life. I'm sure everybody here is feeling that they're doing what they can. But to see the reality of the fact that most of the stuff we buy is made overseas uh, by people who are... Uh, horrible human rights abuses, the environment's being plundered, um, and we buy the stuff here. And I think her statistic is that 99% of the consumer goods that are purchased are, are in landfill, 99% within 12 months. So we've all heard the, the uh, statistics that we need three or four Earths to, to continue with the way that we live today. And so my first take home message is, I try and I want everybody to try to buy better. I think we can all continue to try to buy better. And I'll give you a couple of examples from my life. Uh, when I moved up here from Victoria, I needed a fridge and I contacted Bridgelands and I wanted an Australian made fridge. I knew there was still a factory in Orange. They didn't have them. I had to go to the good guys in Tweed. They were able to supply me with that Australian made fridge. So we know that the people were paid properly and the environment was probably protected in making those fridges. Six months later, all of that fridge making was offshore. So Australian jobs and manufacturing has, co has consistently gone offshore and I just wonder if we all think enough when we go to purchase something, if we ask the question, is there an Australian made option? I went to Mitre 10 about a month ago, I tried to get a wheelbarrow on Gumtree, I couldn't find one, I really needed one. I said, do you have an Australian made wheelbarrow? The guy didn't know, he went and asked one of the other workers and they did have one. So that worker now knows that there's an Australian made one. This is our consumer power. This is, we have to demand it. We have to ask for it. So we know that imported goods, um, we, don't, we generally, unless we know they're ethically made, you can assume that they're not. So what I, what the, the climate change impact of imported goods can be explained 
easily by understanding that your carbon footprint and Australia's emissions, as Mr Shorten has just said, there's no problem with the Dani because when the coals burn overseas, it doesn't actually count towards our greenhouse gas emissions, right? So as long as you just buy imported goods, there's nothing to worry about, right? It's not going to add to climate change caused by Australians, apparently. I've only got two minutes left and I feel I've missed a, a, a few of the things I wanted to say, but buying better is what Marlon Cares is all about. We support and promote the growing consumer demand for conservation. Everybody's got a demand uh, products that are made more ethically. It, the, the speech that I had written, I've published on the Mullen Cares website. If you want to have a look, it's got a lot more detail on it, including links to ethical um, shopping. So that's, you have five minutes, so sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Great. Okay, so that's, that's about buying better. Um, so I was awarded the Local Woman of the Year Award in 2016 on the back of the Plastic Creek. <laughs> You know, I didn't really do anything on my own. That was because Daniel from the IGA agreed to actually run a trial with no plastic bags. If he hadn't agreed to do that, there would have been no Plastic Free July campaign. So it's not really about me. It's about the fact that I ask people to help. I want change and I ask people if they're prepared to work with me. And the result was that they trialled it and obviously they got rid of them. Now, I can't take any credit for the fact that Coles and Woolworths decided to do it all over the country, but it's a great outcome. Um, and the water fountain out in front of Santos was crowdfunded from this community. We raised $9,000 and we only needed 6200 or something. So the rest of that money went to one of the sculptures in the sculpture walk down by the creek. Um, so, fine. Sorry, Pastor. Straws? Straws, no, we haven't won on straws. You can still get them here, plastic straws and plastic cups. See, be the demand. When you go to the bar here and you want water, ask for a glass. That's how we'll get glasses for water. Um, so the second part of um, what I wanted to talk about, the take home that I, I really hope that um, people in the audience might be able to rise to, is to support, choose a local community organisation to support. As Annie said, she's done a great pitch for you know, the call to action that her group and, and the whole success of the CSG, Annie CSG mining has been in the numbers of people who actually came out. So all of the local community organisations, such as Mullen Cares, such as Coram and Repower Byron Shire, we are all limited by our capacity. So we have goals, we want to achieve certain things, but we're limited by the number of people that we've got to help. So Marlon Care's latest project is a library of stuff. So if you haven't heard about it, we're planning to actually provide or grow a library full of all things other than books that people can borrow from. So it's true conservation. It's actually trying to help you not buy stuff. But you know what? The neoliberal capitalist regime is all fueled and funded by profit. So there's no money in talking people out of buying stuff. So my community organisation needs more help. We've only got three people on the committee to bring this library to the community. We need more people. Um, and we will need money to buy assets that we simply don't get in the form of donations. And I know it's the same for other organisations. One Roof Byron, Coram, Repower Byron Shire. They're all a small group of dedicated people trying to trying to achieve fantastic outcomes. And there's people in this room, I'm sure, that have got fabulous skills and maybe a little bit of time that they could offer to a community organisation. And so I just wanted to advertise that on the 20th of December, we're actually going to have an end of year sustainability drinks, where a lot of the local not-for-profits are going to be talking about the year that they've had, the successes and challenges, and also their plans for next year. So if you do think you have time or you want to donate some money, it'd be a great night to come along and listen to the, the local groups and find maybe an organisation that fits with your interests and passions that you could contribute to, because the more people we have, the faster we're going to actually accelerate our goals. So that's it. Great. Thanks for having me. very inspiring just because it's so local. Thank you, Sasha. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about our next speaker, Dr. Liz Elliott, who is a member of the Nagara Institute. And she helped many of us in the Mullumbimby Hospital for many years, so she might be familiar to you. 
She's passionate about educating the community about the reality of the economic situation and has written a book entitled A New Way Now and there are just a few copies for sale there on the, on the table. Liz also wrote long ago a best-selling book called Energy on Health and How to Maintain Your Health and she's worked as a journalist, a cartoonist and she even started a yoga center in Washington and New York and lived in the Bahamas so let's have a warm round of applause for um, thanks for all coming by and thanks for all the wonderful activists talking tonight. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've been pretty downhearted the last few months and I'm sure a few of you have too. The IPCC report uh, shows that we've headed for extinction. The uh, inequality is increasing. Uh, they're the two main issues of our time, of course. We've seen Brazil fall to a right-wing dictator. We see the chaos in Syria and the Middle East, often um, perpetuated by the American war machine. We see the loss of biodiversity, and I believe 60% of our species are now under threat, if already not gone. That really breaks me up. We see the loss of water and soil. I'm particularly interested in soil. And we see so much going on and people are seemingly apathetic. We see the suppression of dissent. So all of this has got me in a bit of a state and I'm sure many of you could identify with that. It seems to be doubly bad for me because <laughs> I wrote a book and studied for 20 years about the solution. And there is a solution, but nobody wants to know. People, as soon as you mention money, finance, everyone clams up like a little um, clam, really, on a, on a barnacle on a stick. <coughs> we talk about something interesting now, like anything. And so it's very disillusioning that when you think you know the solution, and I do believe, that our economy has changed totally in the last 30 years from being about manufacture and creation to being about finance and money making money. We have 2%, 2% of our Australia's GDP, a false measure, is farming, fishing and forestry, 2%. 30% is finance. Put a few people with fingers on computers. What is this? This is nonsense. This is unreal. These people are creaming off. They are basically victimising all real creators, including your Mother Earth. And it's a solution is just as simple. Why is money running things? Why are people obsessed with money? Why is there so much stress? Stress and depression is largely about money and who creates it. And it can be fixed. That's the good news. We can have a public banking system once again and put our money towards good things like affordable housing and environmental repair and genuine jobs for our kids, part-time relevant jobs, of course. And we can do wonderful things when we re um, get a public bank again. We can also control the finance sector. So it's pretty depressing when you see all these terrible things happen and you know we're headed for extinction and you know I think you've got the solution and no one wants me. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Anyway, a few good things have happened. They're not all in Australia. Let's have a look at the school kids this week on Friday are going to strike. Yeah. Yeah. So if you see a bar and it comes up in the big railway park at 10 a.m., I'm going to be one of their monitors with a So, yeah, that's great. We see Extinction Rebellion uh, in, in England. They, they blocked six major London bridges for half an hour the other day with 6,000 younger people saying, no, this is our life, we're going to die if you keep on going with this, cli with this climate change. So that's a marvellous thing. They say 1% of the population of England, if it gets active and is prepared to go to jail, is enough to turn this around. It doesn't take a majority. It does take a leading edge. Already we have 30% of the population in Australia working shorter hours. We have people in America, even the Trump voters, understanding that the treaties are against them and that their jobs are being stolen for lower paid, bad condition jobs. 
you know, overseas. But even in our own country, I don't know those who came and saw the wonderful Shen's talk, she said 1.3 million workers are in Australia under, and under poor conditions with no very few human rights, and they're undermining our workers too. So, yeah, it's um, amazing what's going on because Big young people are changing, the worm has turned. We have GetUp with 1.2 million um, people receiving their emails, so that's a great thing. I believe the right wing are going to try and fund a similar organisation. And we have groups like Unstoppable in America and Moms Across America talking about chemical poisoning of their children. And once you understand the whole petrochemical thing and an and, and agribusiness, then you're going to become more and more radical to look for the real solutions to our children's future. So they're wonderful organisations starting it and that's starting to give me some hope. I guess the thing that's given me most hope recently is looking at Sanders and Corbyn. Now, you remember um, Bernie Sanders, he's the most popular politician still in us in America. Why? Because he's genuine, he's a bit dishrevelled, but he's been genuine for a long time. He's got this track record. 83% of people under 35 say he's the best politician in, a, in America. He could have nearly won, he probably should have won the Democratic nomination, as many of us know. But his policies are becoming more and more focused and um, radical, really. He's, who saw um, his economic advisor on Planet America the other night? Well, you missed a wonderful thing. She said, firstly, their number one demand is to have a, a living wage for all workers and a job for all people who want to work. I would like to add part time to that, but 15 US dollars plus health care. He, she wants to have a trust fund for all young Americans as they're born. He wants to create Medicare for Australia, uh, sorry, for America, and he wants to imp uh, abolish the student debt, which is a huge um, shame that hangs around the neck of American youth. So he's really a very popular politician, but what he's done with his consistency and his incredible campaign is he's moved what's called the Overton Window. The Overton Window is the subjects one's legitimately allowed to um, discuss and still look like a reasonable human, or you know. So we're moving the Overton Window to the left. Things that nobody could say five years ago are now like commonplace. I went into Tweed Hospital a few years ago and I said, oh, I'm actually a bit of a socialist. And six young doctors in a row looked up and said, me too. Oh. Whoa. These are ambitious, clever people. So I think the Overton window has moved and Sanders' campaign is evidence and a creator of that movement. Um, one of the things he really did very well was he all helped all his team organise the most extraordinary campaign, firstly on Facebook and social media. Um, that was great. Then he also had door knocking and I think it was 100 million people were contacted directly by phone or by door knock. How about that? That's extraordinary. This is real people learning to get succinct and clear about their politics, that's the door knockers, and people who are, feel they're being heard about their particular issue. So, say you knock on the door and the person says, oh, I'm interested in horses, well then you talk about how horses are being ruined by neoliberalism and our climate change. You can do it, you know, whatever the issue, because it all is one thing, as someone said, it is all this hierarchy. and. Um, we can do it, we can change. So Sanders has been very inspirational and I can't wait to see who the Democrats um, nominate next. When Elizabeth Warren would be my favourite. She's been resolute on the banking thing. The other person I'm really excited about is Jeremy Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn, as you may know, came to power, uh, power whatever, the, the head of the English uh, opposition Labour Party by sort of a fluke. But very rapidly it became obvious he was really popular. And not only that, I think half a million people have flooded into the English Labour Party. So it's becoming a grassroots organisation. Huge numbers of people turn out to hear him speak. And him, he and his treasurer, whose name is John McDonnell, and he's a real, real radical, are coming up with the most extraordinary policies. And this is what excites me, that here is somebody with a brilliant team trying to work out a transition, a way that us, you know, overfed, 
uh, exhausted, grumpy Westerners can actually make a vibrant society that is sustainable. They're working on it now. And some of the things that he's come up with, which is so good, are free education, a better um, medic, what do they call it, national health. So that's very popular. He's talking about reversing privatisation. He's talking about renationalising water and um, railways. So all of that's very popular because really people are sick of the trickle down thing. They pretty know it doesn't work and now they're sick of privatisation. So he's articulating things that people want to hear and that's really exciting. But he's also coming up with specific programs. Um, he wants the National Bank. Well fancy that. When the public make the money we can put it towards good projects not derivatives which threaten to actually she collapsed our economy next year. I thought it was going to happen this year, but actually it looks like next year now. So, you know, he's got a national bank, a really important thing. The second thing he wants to do is he's going to tax speculative economy, which is the derivative, so that's great, the Tobin tax. The third thing he wants to do is he's going to have 30% of large corporations will be, their boards will be made up of workers. So that's the beginning of getting cooperatives together, enlightened ways of running business for both the community, the worker, and for the inventors and managers. But not this ridiculous thing where, you know, em employers and board members are getting like 400 times the salary of the average worker. Is that the... <laughs> so that's really important. Another thing he says is that all large corporations should immediately give 10% of their shares to to the workers. So that's a really important thing too. So they, this is sort of things that um, that they, they're working on the details of, and I think that's very great. And then the last thing is that government should purchase from small and local corporations. As you know, most of the treaties lock people into buying internationally tendered and often low wage and low environmental standard products. So. If government, the US, UK government, because it looks like they'll get in next time, starts to buy, you know, locally sourced, sustainably made, and pr products from groups that have a ratio of 20 to 1, that is the manager's salary compared to the cleaners. This is news, but it's actually happening in Japan and Germany already to some extent. They do have caps on in, um, executive remuneration. So there's some practical things. A national bank of financial speculative tax, uh, government um, sourcing, and there's some really and way, different ways to have boards and shareholders. These are practical steps. So this is very exciting to me that someone's working it out. But of course there are only central solutions. And of course what we've got to do is not only Re regulate the large, which have got completely out of control, but we have to support the small, and that's the other thing that gives me heart, living in Malambimbi with the beauty of the trees and the people and the nature and our beautiful farmer's market and our fabulous music festival, and that's what's kept me going through a period of political sadness. And I hope you can all have time to, one, understand the banking system, which really takes an hour of your time in your life, an hour. Um, secondly, would you please have a look at what Corbyn's um, working on because he's really out there with a brilliant team trying to do important work. And lastly, please enjoy the trees because in the end nature is what heals. So Jenny is quite a multi-talented lady and through her storytelling performances, recordings and workshops, Jenny helps people experience the ancient healing wisdom held in told stories, both for children and adults. So let's have a warm welcome for Jenny Cargill Stam. Thank you. I relate more to the word enchantivist, in a sense, than activist. And I feel very, very honored to be invited to speak tonight. I would like to attempt to answer the questions that Nagara have asked us to address with a story. And I would invite you to suspend your disbelief and shift from your head down into your belly, down into your heart. Let your belly go floppy. Some of us women used to holding it in, let it go flop. 
you to sink down, have a few deep breaths as I tell you a story and I promise that it will make sense, hopefully. I plan for it to make sense at the end of why I would choose to tell this story in this context. Golden Heart. Once there was a little boy with golden hair and golden skin and a golden heart. Golden Heart was his name, but his dad was awfully sad. He was awesomely, morbidly, chronically sad. Hey Dad, why are you so sad? But the wind blew his words away and his father wasn't listening anyway. But as the little boy grew, his heart caught the bug. The sadness German, he got so awfully sad. He was awesomely, morbidly, chronically sad. Hey Dad, why am I so sad? But the wind blew his words away, and his father wasn't listening anyway. Well, one fine day, his dad passed away. Of grief, they say, he flew off to heaven with wings and a harp, and was never sad again. The golden heart said, Oh, Daddy Dad, you were so sad, you made me mad, and I vow and declare, I will never, I will never again be sad. Then Goldenar took his beautiful heart. He threw it in a tin box, a rusty old tin box, and he threw the key into the wide and wonderful sea. And the king of the sea caught the key and said, Oh, my son, my golden one, what have you done to yourself, my son? But the waves washed his words away, and the boy wasn't listening anyway. Yet at night, he dreamed of a great mermaid with deep green eyes and silver hair. She took him way down there, down to a cave far beneath the waves. She said, listen young man, listen to my plan. Take this key you threw away. Unlock the tin your heart is in or it'll be your head that you live in. But the waves washed her words away and in the morning he forgot what she did say. Well, not before long, Golden Heart was grown with a son of his own. Golden Heart Junior was his name, was his son's name, and Golden Heart Junior played in the rain. Yet at night, he dreamed of a great mermaid with deep green eyes and silver hair. She told him tales from Earth's end, and they played all night in the sparkling, wonderful sea. One day, the boy asked his dad, Hey, Dad. Well, what does it mean to be a man? And do you really keep your heart in a tin? Because, well, that's what my silver-haired friend said it's in. But the waves washed his words away, and his father wasn't listening anyway. So the boy took a key from the great mermaid, unlocked the tin, found a heart of gold, still beating strong, so I'm told, and the heart flew out from the young boy's hand. All it wanted was home, and in two seconds flat, it was back inside the man. And that is why on that day, Golden Heart Senior cried all day. He made rivers and lakes with his sweet loving tears and he lived happily for years and years. He always listened to what his heart did say. And why would I tell you that story? I told, it's okay, you don't have to be kind of I wrote that story in response to a very personal experience of a man that I was deeply in love with, I had a relationship with him, and I couldn't, he couldn't feel his feelings, and so I wrote that poem. And I went on to have many relationships with men who couldn't feel their feelings. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be fairly common. Um, but then I discovered that in fact it's not only men who can't feel their feelings. You know, there are children who can't feel their feelings, there are women who can't feel their feelings increasingly in our culture. And I, I went from feeling that it was a personal story to feeling that was, it was a societal story as well, a sociological story. So, uh, Thomas Berry said, we are in danger right now because we are between stories. We haven't got the right story, we're in between stories. And I, I spent a lot of time looking for the right story, the magic story, the silver bullet that would cure all our problems. You know, I was on this hunt, on this journey to look for the story. But maybe I misinterpreted what he really meant. And then I read 
um, Dr. Martin Shaw, who, to my great relief, he said, he often hears that people are looking for the story, maybe inspired by that quote about us being in danger because we're between stories. And he said, but you know, the perfect stories for our culture arrived 5,000 years ago. We just forgot them, and we forgot how to relate to them. And I would say, standing on this ground, standing on this ancient land, with this ancient beautiful culture that still, despite everything, survives, that we could say, actually, those stories, we can't even count how long ago they came. But we just forgot them. And Charles Eisenstein quotes from Thich Nhat Hanh, he talks about the story of interbeing and says that we are the end of the age of separation, the end of the story of separation, and we need to move in, or he says we are moving in to the story of interbeing, the story where we understand the delightful and amazing and ecstatic interconnectedness of everything. And so I tell the story of Golden Heart, even though it's kind of a personal story from a personal experience that you could say is just about masculinity, but the beauty of stories and metaphor is that they live on many levels and everybody takes the metaphor, if you can get your head around a metaphor, your heart around a metaphor, everyone takes that medicine in the way that they need it. You may take it as a personal story, you can take it as a sociological story change the story, change the system. To be human is to tell stories. I mean, maybe the song of the humpback whale is a big story that we don't understand, but it is distinct about humanity that we tell stories. In fact, you could say that human culture is an elaborate weave, a tapestry of stories. Law is a story. Economy is a story. Gender is a story. Love is a story. Politics is definitely a story, yes? We live in these stories, and George Monbiot, who was quoted earlier, which Richard re referred to in, um, in the introduction, George Monbiot talks about stories are the organizing principles of people's lives. And that's what Nagara has been unpacking, the neoliberal story that has become the organizing principle for people's lives. And he says, you cannot just say, that story is dead and dysfunctional, let it go. It's like a dog with a bone, you know, we've, we've got to have another story. We can't let it go until we have a new story. And that is what some of, some of the potential of activists who are telling the stories, Annie telling the story of what's possible, the activists here, um, Sasha telling the story of what's possible, new stories, and old stories, listening to the indigenous people and their stories of deep connection to country that we've forgotten, that we long for. I had the great privilege of being at the Fields of Healing Festival, which I highly recommend you go to next year. It was so, so beautiful. And that was the story. It's the story of the ancient ones. And we long for that. And our ancestors, when you go back far enough, even in the Western Kosh, if you go back far enough, our ancestors told those stories of interbeing too. We were deeply rooted in the earth. We knew that. Change the story, change the system. So the three things that I would say, I've already said one, change the story, change the system. And I would also say, so Dr. Martin Shaw um, talks about how when he tells a story, people say, oh, I was so enchanted by your story. And he says, I don't want to enchant people, I want to wake them up. I want to wake them up. And this is what Nagara is doing, waking people up from the neoliberal story, the neoliberal enchantment. If you want to think of enchantment as a negative thing, but I disagree. I think enchantment is also a positive thing. Just as anything can be bad. Medicine can be unhealthy or helpful. Anything can be good or bad. It always has a flip side. And the same with enchantment. You can become enchanted into become some kind of a zombie enacting the dominant script of your culture. Or you can be re-enchanted. There's another word I love called um, enchantivism, which was coined by Dr. Chalquist who's uh, into deep psychology, and, and he talks about being re-enchanted with the love for the world, the wonder of the cosmos, the divinity of our incredibly sublime planet and, and everything about it. To fall in love again with ourselves and our wondrous self. To fall in love again with each other and humanity. And there's so much to feel 
disheartened about. How can we fall in love with ourselves and each other and fall in love with every single species on the planet and this beautiful interconnected biosphere that we love so dearly and everything that we've done, everything that, it, that all the peril that we are in has been created by the imagination, by the mind and by the amazing uh, myth, the Shambhala warrior, which Joanna Macy brought to the West, talks about that all of this destruction is caused by Manomaya. It's all from the imagination, which means it can be undone by the imagination. But we may want to think that technology will save us, but it's not going to be technology and it's not going to be thinking. Just as Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem with the same thinking that got you into the problem. You have to have a different approach to get out of it. And I feel it's a revolution of the heart. And other people are saying that. Nothing less is called for than a revolution of the heart. And that's why I told you Golden Heart. And so if I were to invite you to do anything, I would say, go to your rusty tin. Take the key from the mermaid. Tune into the divine. Listen to the wind. Listen to the ocean. Take the key. Unlock the tin your heart is in and let it fly back to wherever it is and help everyone around you do that too. And I'll finish. I'll finish somewhere. <laughs> With, we are stardust. We are golden. We are billion year old carbon caught in the devil's bargain. And we've got to get ourselves back to the garden. So our second to last speaker, you may all be familiar because you've probably seen Michael Bolson here month after month being our wonderful video producer, but many of you are probably not aware that he is one of Australia's most highly acclaimed uh, documentary makers and has made hundreds of documentaries since he first started in 1966. So I'd just like to mention a few of them, Michael, as you begin your way up here. Um, movies on Australia's wild places, The Coral Triangle. He did A Hard Rain with David Badbury. I imagine he's probably done others with David as well. Reef Reborn, The Tasmanian Wilderness, Brumby Horses, Kakadu Man, Arn Arnhem Land People, Marine Life of Sydney Harbour. These are all full, full documentaries that he's done for various companies. And then further afield, he's gone into The Invisible People of the Amazon, The Mountains of Africa, People Ballooning in Mount Everest, The Trobriand Islands, and on the trail of Genghis Khan. And that's just a small selection that I pulled from his amazing list. So please let's welcome Michael Bolson from Entity Productions up to the stage. Well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge the owners of this country, the uh, bunch of old people, because they are, their story is such an ancient one. And uh, there's a cod hole of Julian Rocks, which used to be a habitat cave where Bunjalung people lived about 10,000 years ago. And the coastline was 15 kilometres further out to sea. A bit louder, Michael. Yeah, the coastline was 15 kilometres further east at that stage because the sea level was um, a great deal lower. And the Bunjalung had to put up their own global warming, which was the end of the last ice age. Now, the end of the last ice age was only my, about four degrees less than the present temperature. It wasn't very much colder. So you can see how four degrees makes a huge difference. And four degrees up, which is where we're heading for, even at the current CO2, is a massive rise in temperature. It's reptile territory. We haven't lived in that sort of temperature in, and more recently than about five million years ago. It was about the last time the temperature was that hot. So we're... It's a, it's, a big, um, it's a big problem because the weather we're experiencing today is actually the weather from, is a CO2 level from 1997. There's a 25 year lag in the weather because the biosphere is relatively large. And um, the weather that in 25 years time will be the CO2 levels from today. So there's this sort of massive um, time lag in weather. But anyway, I thought I'd tell you a story. I was going to talk about incrementalism, which is something inspired by Aidan Ricketts. 
because I really enjoyed one of his talks on incrementalism. I was going to talk about the triumph of incrementalism because even the idea that we're paying tribute to the indigenous people who were here in this country and still are in this country and that the idea of sharing sovereignty and indeed creating a treaty with them is very much part of the current heartfelt desire of us. Um, is, a, is, a, is, all, is, is incrementalism, in other words, is this changes for a better world already happening? What happened with the LGBTQI community, with marriage equality, was an incremental change. So the yearning can go on for decades, the push can be there for a long time, but suddenly incrementalism breaks through and there is a kind of a eureka moment where suddenly you realise you're living, you're living, you're living the actual thing you've been praying for in your heart. And, um, so I thought I'd take you back and tell you the story of global warming over time because that's what I'm currently researching on a film series I'm trying to work up with David Worth. And the, um, we start right back in, 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 if you like, the beginning. Now, there never really was a beginning because we're talking, we live in infinity and we live in eternity. But we have a relative beginning we call the Big Bang. And now that Big Bang, well, to put it this way, there's a chicken and egg story where they often use, fundamentalists will often use this argument of the chicken and the egg, what came first? And of course, it's a, people are sort of stumped by that conundrum. And what came first really was the egg by a couple of billion years. Because the industrial chicken is a very recent hybrid that's been growing slowly over time inside the egg. And of course, that egg goes right back through the birds and then through the dinosaurs and through the amphibians and through the fishes. And it goes right back to millions of years and we are all, all in this room, we're all heroes on the hero journey because we are all directly descended from that genesis. We, 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 we are life in process and at the moment we're hominids or homonyms, humans, and we're homo sapiens but we're, we're on this sort of journey together through from the most extraordinary beginning. And um, I'll go back to the sun because the sun is really the engine of all creation on Earth and gravity, which is the other force. Gravity is like the, the, the unifying field, if you like, that makes, that brought the whole of the manifest universe into co coalesce into balls in space. But the sun is the engine that was both the creator of our planet and it is also the sustainer of our planet and ultimately apparently will be the destroyer of our planet. So it's very interesting that it has those three functions. And sadly, it might be the destroyer of our lives much more quickly than we even imagined. But this, our sun was a third generation sun. There were two, two suns before our sun. The, the universe is 13 billion years old, but our solar system is only four and a half billion years old. So what happened between the 13 and the four and a half was two supernovas, two massive suns which gave birth eventually to our sun. So we're like a, a reincarnated sun. And all the planets that threw out from that sun, including Earth, the four hard planets and the four gas giants, were all sort of born out of this sort of extraordinary mega explosion four and a half billion years ago. And um, I'll, I'm going to now make a sort of a quick segue to an event that took place 250 million years ago, which is significant to today. Because 250 million years ago, there was a um, there was a, there was a supercontinent called Pangaea, and um, the um, Earth was 12 degrees hotter then, and there was no pole, no polar ice caps, so the sea levels were 50 meters higher, which would have meant if the Kunin Range had been there then, which it wasn't, it would have been water going right back and halfway up the Kunin Range. It would have been a very different world, and we'd be sitting underwater here now in Mullen. So, but what happened in the Permian? was that it got so hot, it was because there was so much volcanic activity belching huge amounts of carbon into the atmosphere, that it got so hot, and carb plants love carbon dioxide, don't get me wrong, they're made of it. In fact, the plants, trees are really gas giants, they're made of gas, and the gas is stored as carbon, and as oxygen, and as hydrogen, and as all sorts of other things. But what happens is they just build up such a huge mass of organic matter that it got so hot and so unpleasant on Earth that they all just rotted and died. And that formed the coal layers, which make up the coal beds all through Australia, the Permian coal. So that's 250 million years old. And just to cap it off, literally, the sandstone through the Sydney Basin, which is where a lot of our coal comes from, 
was actually capped off by about 250 feet of alluvium, which was, became sandstone, the famous sandstone of um, the Blue Mountains and the sandstone of um, Sydney Heads and all those beautiful sandstone in Sydney, which looks so picturesque today, was actually the dead zone that happened after the Permian extinction. So the coal beds that lay underneath that, which had been chuffed off to the um, power mills and the power stations and the um, steel mills of Asia are actually creating the current mass extinction. So it's the coal from the world's worst mass extinction, the Permian, which was 250 million years ago, which is actually fueling much of the present mass extinction. So it's one of the great ironies. Another extinction that happened which was significant to us because it gave birth to us as a species was the KT extinction 65 million years ago when an asteroid, a wayward asteroid who was random and lost in space. It was only 10 kilometers wide, which is about the size of the Everest Massif. But it slammed into the Earth with such force, about 60,000 kilometers an hour, it created a massive upheaval. It blew, an explosion went up in space. And it actually started spot fires and it set the Earth off in this enormous upheaval. That was followed five million years later by a thing called the Deccan Traps because Australia, which was then still attached to Antarctica, hadn't broken away, but India, which is on the same tectonic plate as Australia, had broken away, and was halfway up the Indian Ocean, and was crossing over where Reunion, the islands of Reunion are now. And as it went over a hot spot in the Earth's surface, this enormous explosion of volcanic activity happened through there. So we had the asteroid collision combined with the Deccan Traps, and what the Deccan Traps are, the Deccan Plateau in India, which is a quarter of India, was this massive outpouring of volcanic activity, basalt mountains. You know, behind Mumbai, you go inland there, and it's just this huge volcanic, volcanic region. And that killed off what may have remained of the dinosaurs. And it was only because the dinosaurs died off that we came into being, that we, the mammals, the age of mammals began on the back of the dinosaurs. And there was two particular mammals which are, are interesting to us. It was the evolution of the hominins, which were the or well, hominids, which became the hominins, which became ourselves sitting in this room today, and also the whales. Now, there was an animal as big as a rhino, it's probably omnivorous, went into the water, started to feed in the water a bit. It was to become the great whale, and it evolved over millions of years. It went in 50 million years ago, 15 million years after the KT extinction event. And it, um, it, we were to share a destiny because later, like for the first 200 years of the Industrial Revolution, we killed millions of whales to fuel the Industrial Revolution. So we were evolving as hominids, hominins, and the whale was evolving at the same time to become these, the biggest beast ever to live on Earth. And we actually had this strange entwined destiny with each other, where we were actually feeding off their carcasses to fuel our Industrial Revolution. And that same Industrial Revolution has swept through to um, become the coal and oil-fired industrial revolution. Now, coal and oil are actually ancient sunlight. I'm sure some of you have read the book. Ancient sunlight is the sunlight that was stored hundreds of millions of years ago, and we're now digging up. There's recent sunlight, which is hydropower and timber or wood. And then there's current sunlight, which is the energy we're all up hoping for, which is renewable, which is going on all the time. So there's this sort of journey through um, through, uh, so what I'm, what I'm saying is that these three kinds of sunlight are actually the, what we're really feeding on. So while the sun is both fueling us today, it also has fueled us before. And so we're living off the fuel of sunlight. So I'm getting a few hurry ups here, so I better wind it up. Now, 22 million years ago, this volcano was active. But Australia wasn't in the same place as it is now. Australia was 1,100 kilometres further south, and where, the, where we are now was actually just off the northeast coast of Tasmania. So we've been travelling north about the speed that fingernail grows for 22 million years, which is seven centimetres a year. In my lifetime, Australia has moved from the corner of this rostrum to in here, about 15 feet further north. And we're on a collision course with Africa. So there's this kind of, it is about the triumph of incrementalism, this talk. It is an incremental journey. And then where we're going to with it is, of course, I better just cut through a lot of this stuff. Oh yes, what's happening now? The rise in temperature. Coming to the current story of um, global warming. 
The temperature's rising now between 10 and 100 times faster than it's ever risen before on Earth. Now, speed kills, literally. And what's happening now, there's between 150 and 200 species an hour are dying on our planet at the moment. We are in the middle of a mass extinction. And I don't think, and that's a thousand times faster than baseline. In other words, it would be a thousand times slower than that, that rate of extinction. Now, many of these species we haven't even discovered. They're dying before we even know about them. So they're obviously happening at the microcosmic level as well. But the, the, um, the attrition is enormous. And where we're heading to is probably four or five degrees. So we're looking for, to a very different planet. And that's just based on, I mean, they, they talk about one and a half degrees, they talk about two degrees. They sort of know it's three or four. And unless they really do something, it's growing at the moment at one and a half percent a year. The Chinese are currently building 400 coal-fired power stations around the world. There's an enormous amount of coal burning still to happen. So, and the other thing, of course, is deforestation. Now, look, I'll just wrap it up now with a, a little finishing summary. Some good things that came out of our extraordinary journey as humans, homo sapiens, was we invented, in the Cold War, we invented atomic bombs and a delivery system and, we, and space technologies. It may well be an atomic bomb on the nose of a on the nose of an outbound missile that stops the next, next asteroid from colliding with the Earth. So that's the good news. The, 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 the other good news is, and this is important news for people who are interested in coal, is that we're between ice ages. We had the last ice, ice age ended only. It peaked about 50,000 years ago. It ended about 10,000 years ago. We're heading for another one. And we're going to need every ounce of coal we can scrape together to keep the Earth warm enough. Now, that's true. In other words, there's a very good argument to make for keeping all the fossil fuels as a thermal heating device for the planet Earth. Also, what the other great um, problem is, is um, the um, acidification of the ocean. Now, the whales, that's a great comeback story. Whales came back from about 800 survivors about 50 years ago, and so in half a century they've come from 800 up the east coast of Australia to 33,000. So that's been a triumph of leaving nature to itself. The trouble with that is, with global warming, is you have all the carbon in the atmosphere creates carbolic acid in the ocean, which means that the exoskeletal life that whales live on is, won't be able to form shells. In fact, most of the exoskeletal life in the ocean won't be able to form shells. So there'll be a huge die-off of krill, which is the food of most of the great whales. And indeed, the basis of much of the food chain. So as part of the great extinction at the moment is the end of krills. And look, I suppose, um, it's a knock-on effect, the end of whales. So I just hope that fires you up to um, <laughs> engage with the subject. Uh, it's only a fraction of what I wrote down, but uh, I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much. So our final speaker tonight is Aidan Ricketts, and he's an academic with the School of Law and Justice at Southern Cross University. And he's also an internationally recognized social change trainer and author, having published the Activist Handbook, a step-by-step -step guide to participatory democracy. And he published that in London in 2012. Aidan has also provided social change training for organizations throughout Australia, most notably working with Lockthegate and with Gasfield Free Northern Rivers, which is perhaps how we first really got to hear about him, um, in the lead up to the historic Bentley blockade. As well as activism training, Aidan specializes in the use of non-linear change strategies and value-based framing as part of his social change work. So maybe you'd like to come and explain a little bit about that. Let's have a really good welcome for Aidan Ricketts. It was, it was very beautiful, you know, to sort of touch on that story of the heart because it, it, it fits in with what I was sort of wanting to say and also that just beautiful story through, through geological time. Um, geological time is one of the things that gives me hope and, and faith and I'll touch on that in a moment. Um, but let's start at the bad end. Um, 
climate change and rising global fascism, these are the things that really worry me. Those two words, they just don't, they're not several words, but those two concepts, you know, runaway climate change and rising global fascism, I kind of remind anyone I talk to that these are the two big things that are coming. Um, I've been upsetting people and myself a little bit lately um, by sort of going, oh, look, can we all stop fighting amongst ourselves with our identity politics because, um, you know, it is important that all, you know, oppressed minorities have their voices heard, but goodness me, um, we're all going to be standing together on a rock at the end of time, the way things are going. Um, and, and it worries me that, you know, it worries me that sometimes when the problems are so big, we despair and we don't want to look at them, and so we turn around and sort of fight fights amongst ourselves in many ways, and we find the enemies um, amongst ourselves rather than the biggest enemies on the globe, the big corporations, the mode of production even, um, which makes me sound a little Marxist, but I think it's one of the really useful Marxist terms. Um, what worries me really, I mean, looking at the IPCC report, and a few people have mentioned that tonight, is, you know, is just how graphically terrifying it is. Um, we now know that we are heading for mass extinction and we are possibly heading for human extinction as Extinction Rebellion tells us, although that's that's only one form of extinction. That's you know, probably uh, one of Gaia's most clever ones. Um, and and it's it, it sort of brings you to the idea that you know, are we really going to turn this ship around? And I think that's where that, that's where I think my you know, experience with complexity, which Annie's helped mentor me with, and uh, nonlinear change helps me actually deal with these things and go. You know, if we have to think of these things in a linear way, if we have to think that we're going to turn the whole ship around, um, it really does cause despair. I'm really not sure um, at all that we can turn the ship around. I tend to feel that we have reached the point where the Titanic is speeding towards the iceberg, um, where the captain is drunk and won't listen to us, and is accelerating, and that we actually have to start launching the lifeboats whether the captain allows us to or not. Um, I think we are at that point. Um, and that's where I suppose getting you know, from that despair to some sort of hope, um, and that's where sort of thinking about geological time helps in some ways, and thinking about the heart helps, is sort of, and complexity theory helps, is knowing that when you get the closest to the edge of chaos is the time when the smallest experiments can have the biggest impact as well. And, you know, one of the stories I really like to recall often at this time is about solar power, is about, um, you know, because the thing about launching the multiple experiments, launching the lifeboats, sowing the seeds of re-emergence in a time of crisis, is the idea that, you know, or, or we, is, is that you sow all these things and some of them really flourish. And you may or may not expect that, and some of them don't necessarily flourish but you need to be sowing all those seeds. And I think for activists and for people in communities, that's actually, actually encouraging. Instead of sitting around going, well, what's the one big solution that we need to do to turn it around? Do we need to smash the patriarchy? Do we need to smash capitalism? I don't think we're going to smash either of those in time or perhaps at all. Um, instead, what we will do is look at the system as a whole and find all of the numerous and all of the small innovative and clever ways that we can change and sow the seeds of re-emergence, possibly for after the great catastrophe. And that's one of the things that we need to be sort of looking at now is, is and not all of us, but those of us who survive a potential great catastrophe and what is the rebuilding. I often think I, I lived in the Pacific Islands for a while and part of the story of um, some of the Pacific Islands, the Polynesians in particular, is they'd land on a small island uh, and there would be, an, and I'll do this very quickly, there'd be an ecological collapse after a, a time of abundance. And then one group would move on to find another island, but the group that remained behind had experienced the ecological collapse and that group had to regenerate that island. And those are the group, those are the cultures that developed the customary environmental management principle, the ability to come back from crisis and then manage sustainably. And so that's where many of those lessons were learned. And that lesson of destroying one island and then having to regenerate it is sort of what we've got because we know our planet's an island. Um, back onto the solar power example, um, it was just one of those things that, you know, hippies, misfits, 
sort of off the grid, off the grid hermits were doing all through the 70s and all through the 80s. And then suddenly we find in our time of crisis, because those people were doing that innovative and fringe experiment, it has actually laid the groundwork. It's one of the, you know, it's one of the seeds that fell on fertile ground, and it's part of that groundwork. You know, when the big tree falls over in the rainforest, there's a whole lot of little plants there that have been sitting dormant for quite a while, but the sun suddenly hits them and they begin to grow. So that gives us a lot of uh, inspiration, I suppose, as activists to keep, you know, to keep the faith and keep engaging in wherever our hearts lead us in what those experiments are that we think we need to push forward with. But let's get back to the grief first, you know, because I think we, we really look at the IPCC report or we look at rising global fascism and we contemplate the great catastrophe that we may well and appear to be heading into. There is sort of a moment of pause that we need in order to be able to go on. My, my principle that I have came to, it, it's sort of, you know, the, the co coalescence of sort of my meditation and, and trying to deal with my own life as well as activism and it's the principle of accept things exactly as they are first and then find a resourceful way forward and that is just this mantra that keeps coming to me and coming to me and as I kept teaching the students year after year in my activism class it just got a bigger and bigger part of the teaching um, and I think grief is in it is part of that as well yes. that, that what we need to do with the approaching catastrophe is um, accept and grieve. One of the very weird things that I do with students um, and with activist training is get people to sit down, close their eyes and say, now I want you to actually visualise failure. I want you all as activists to first visualise complete failure in all of the campaigns that you are working on. And when you have accepted failing, then I want you to stand up, take a breath and commit yourself to bringing about a better outcome. There's a good reason for doing that because it helps avoid burnout. Like even just in all of our small campaigns, it helps avoid burnout. If you make your body, if you put your body on the line, if you put your health, if you put your well-being, if, if success is a precondition for your personal survival and well-being, you will burn out. If you can accept failure and then recommit yourself, you can actually walk a path of joyous activism throughout your entire life knowing that you may fail. And it's actually important to have the resilience of knowing that you may fail. And so, as weird as it sounds, people don't like it. They sort of go, no, we've got to believe we'll win, otherwise we'll lose all, all, all um, hope. But I'm not sure of that, you know. I actually think we need to find that resilience in ourselves where we accept the possibility of failure and then recommit ourselves to it. Because if there's one thing that's really inspired me about activism, it's like, you know, why would we be activists? And the answer that ends up coming back to me is because it's really the only really useful and important thing we could be doing with our lives as humans. And I don't necessarily mean we all have to be political activists or nonviolent direct action activists, but activists on whatever level we are. What else are we doing in our lives that's actually useful or important other than committing ourselves to bringing about a better world um, after we've finished feeding ourselves and feeding our kids? and hopefully that brings about another world as well. The other thing I think is about surviving the coming crisis, and that's what I really liked about Jenny's talk, is that the crisis is happening because of a collective psychosis, known as, whether we call it capitalism, um, neoliberalism, whatever we call it, it's a collective psychosis. A psychosis in which we've lost our connection to nature, lost our connection to our heart, lost our connection to each other and community. Um, and if we stay in that psychosis, we will die of the grief as it goes down. Um, if we can connect through to the planet, to nature, to the larger, larger, larger universe, which is why I love thinking about geological time, then there's something way, 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 way bigger than us that we are a part of that is eternal, that we can have faith in. And if we die in the catastrophe, if our families die, if our communities die, because we do expect not only species extinction, but massive loss of the human population, to know that there's something bigger than us that we're a part of, that we believe in, that we're innately connected to, that's going to continue. I sort of joyfully like to think of the universe as a great big composting heap. 
um, that we are all that we are all composting. Um, we're all getting recycled when we die. I don't I don't specifically believe in reincarnating um, myself or an, an identity. I just kind of think that. Um, you know, because I've never met anyone with a past life as a sort of a, a, a chambermaid or a peasant. They were always, you know, Leonardo da Vinci like Serge. Um, they were always someone important. I actually think that, you know, it's just giant composting heap. Uh, it go, it, whatever we are goes in, it swirls around and it comes back like nature appears to do with absolutely every tree that dies in every bit of matter. I don't know. I'm not the expert on this, but that's certainly how I feel about it and I'm quite happy to be composted when I go. Which gets me down really to now, a wonderful conversation I had with Carmel Flint the night of the Lock Gate dinner, where we just looked at each other and we, we were full of the grief, we were full of the despair about climate change, about the IPCC report, and we just sort of finally reached this point that we agreed on where we went, but you know what? No matter how many species die, no matter if there's human extinction, no matter how bad it gets, we know that the origin of life on Gaia was extremophile bacteria which emerged in the lava flows of the volcanoes. That's where the first life emerged and that evolved to photosynthesis and started using the sun. That evolved through to everything we've seen and you know that beautiful talk that and that has taken us through several extinction events and no matter how big it starts again and it, and it does it again. So if you need one little tiny, and, and so what I'm sort of saying, if we can really connect down into the universe, into the planet itself, into life itself, it's that. It's not our connect. It's not our our attachment to success. It's not our attachment to turning the ship around. If that can't be done, certainly we will try. But if we can really just put our roots right down into the connectedness we have to that thing, which is so much bigger than ourselves, we will realise and find some kind of um, faith in the idea that shit, even if it all goes, and even if there is mass extinction, you know, of all higher life forms, life on Gaia, Gaia and its life, I, I don't, I just can't believe that Gaia and its life can ever be extinguished because it came from extremophile bacteria and lava, and it will come, you know, and it will evolve again. And as we know, there's billions of years to do that and something else will come and we'll all be re recycled, we'll all be composted and we can come back to it. I know that's all a little bit sort of theological, but um, that's what I was like. So on that note, I would also like to add as a professional astrologer that um, one of the reasons I really love Nagara Institute is because if and when this economic collapse comes in the world, which I believe may well be in January 2020, very soon, and Australia will not be as badly hit as many places in the world, but um, the, one of the great things about Nagara Institute is we have a mailing list of about 900. So if the shit hits the fan, we will be able to unite together in perhaps more constructive ways than we can even imagine right now. So it's very great to have everyone who will come together.